And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. Hello from down under. Dr. Adam Jirachi in Adelaide, Australia. On this chilly winter day here, Donna Lauren in California's sunny summertime brings to life her autobiography she and I collaborated on. Today, Donna continues reading with Chapter 2, I Didn't Know the Gun Was Loaded, presented in two parts over two episodes. Part one will tell you about her very early years when her career was charted out by her mother and adopted dad one night at the family dinner table. Part two is all about the Mickey Mouse Club. Let's start with part one. Go, Donna. Chapter two. I didn't know the gun was loaded. They called me the Marvista Thrush. And who were they? Some journalists and media from the local rags. The nickname was thrust upon me by a journalist, Rob Jones, who worked for a local West Side paper. Mar Vista is a nearby seaside community, a suburb of L.A. where I grew up. Mr. Jones seemed to show up at almost every appearance I made in L.A. After all, some things I did before my career really took off were newsworthy on a very local level. Even performing at a military hospital or winning second place in an amateur contest. Eventually, my dad would submit photos of my latest whereabouts and Rod would publish them. It's interesting for the local community who may not know you personally, but they do know where you live. They know where Grandview Boulevard is, and in a way, my feelings of questioning where I belonged regarding my family were offset by belonging to the community. Sitting on a tire swing hanging from the branch of a tree at my Uncle Don's, I heard a twangy man's voice coming from his tiny white clapboard cottage. Your cheating heart will tell on you. That song really resonated with me. Swinging and humming along with whom I later discovered was Hank Williams, I felt a special kinship to the music. There was no way at two and a half years of age I could understand the lyrics, but honestly, it touched my heart. When my brother Alan was born in November 1949, my mother would walk me up the block to Uncle Don's farm. Actually, we called him uncle only as an affectionate term. I suppose my mother trusted him and his wife to leave me there for hours. Even at this age, I was a little confused by her actions. There were mixed messages coming from my parents as early as I can remember. The phrase, you'll be kidnapped if you're out of sight, was constantly expressed by both mom and dad. Even though this fear was instilled in me, I remember feeling safe in this one acre, little tiny one horse farm with terrace gardens, rabbit hutches, and lots of ducks and chickens which was an anomaly in my neighborhood on Grandview Boulevard. The life streaming from the flowers and the butterflies that flew around me seemed to dance with the music in the air. Not once did the lady of the house ever show herself. The dark shadow in the doorway had an omnipresent mystery. Instead, a flow of freedom formed by the sounds of her radio gracefully delivered her beauty. This arrangement went on for about three years while my mother was raising my brother and she would take this opportunity to have me babysat by Uncle Don and his wife. This was my refuge, a tiny farm in the suburbs, plants, animals, music, a surrogate uncle with a safe environment. That was chosen for me and I guess I chose for myself. On a foggy spring night after my third birthday, I lay in bed watching the shadows on my walls and felt my breath change in the cool and damp night air. I got scared when I could only take a little air in. Breathing out was getting more and more difficult. I started making sounds that brought my mother in to see what was happening to me. I heard her say to my dad, call Dr. Kemp. Our doctor made house calls in an emergency and this seemed to be one. 
My mother stood at the foot of my bed, glaring at me. Our eyes were transfixed on one another's. She didn't try to comfort me. How could I know? But in this moment, I felt we were making a silent agreement. And in fact, I had an awareness at this young age of an intuition that the attention she would give me would only be through illness. By this, I mean a conditional kind of distorted love relationship based on my weaknesses. This was the only affection I remember receiving from her. To the contrary, her parents, whom I knew, held me, comforted me, and instilled a warm, unconditional love. I intuitively knew my mother's feelings for me were in some form rejection as well as jealousy. I felt a stranglehold come from her as we consummated our lifetime agreement. Dr. Kemp arrived with his little black bag and he asked me to raise my left leg. He injected me behind my knee with adrenaline. Then he set up an atomizer, a little glass bulb connected to what looked like a perfume sprayer that contained the adrenaline. When Dr. Kemp left, my dad walked me into our little dinette and opened the window. I remember it was late at night and he laid a pillow on the windowsill, told me to rest my head and breathe in the sea air. I felt very lost and lonely. The only comfort I knew was to sing, and I wished that I could in that moment. A little voice inside me whispered, singing will make your lungs stronger. I listened to that message throughout my life. That glass atomizer became a fixture by my bed every day being filled by my mother with more medicine. My first asthma attack at age three manifested into a lifelong condition. There was a tension between my mother and me that caused a relationship between us of control and dominance. Rather than resisting, I complied with almost every wish of hers. By age five, my constant singing to myself led her to entering me into a talent contest being held at a supermarket in Culver City, hosted by Chef Milani. She faced me with a proposition. She spoke to me as though I were able to understand a bribe and offered the opportunity to travel to the amateur contest in Uncle Dunn's Model T Ford and sit in the rumble seat. My mother decided to have me sing How Much Is That Doggy in the Window, which was a smash hit for Patty Page. My mother taught me the song and began showing her jealousy and frustration that it wasn't her in the spotlight. Almost from that moment on, she began saying that she couldn't sing anymore. Apparently, she fancied herself a good singer while singing along with her favorite songs from her era of the swing bands. I took second place and lost to a baton twirling acrobat. This little victory was enough for my parents to think that they could persuade me to do this more. Soon after, I found myself coaxed into singing at a military hospital. It was a veterans hospital in West LA, not far from Mar Vista, at a theater called Wadsworth. I was prepared to sing Enjoy Yourself, a song made popular by Tommy Dorsey, one of my mother's favorite swing bands. Standing in the dark passages backstage, I could feel a trickle of pee running down the inside of my leg. My mother sensed the fear. When I looked down into the dark, cloudy space to find her hand holding a $5 bill, I knew exactly what that meant. It would be her way or else. Ultimately, there is little integrity in succumbing to a price but what was I to do? She handed it to me and literally scarred me for decades. I walked out onto the stage and stood by a microphone. In front of me were men sitting in wheelchairs with bottles and tubes hanging from metal poles. The lights in the hall were like daylight. I could see the ex-soldiers in their misery. I nodded to the piano player to begin. All my fear left when I sang, enjoy yourself, it's later than you think. When I ended, I saw smiles on the men's faces. 
One little song cheered them up and made me feel good too. In private, I would sing to myself as a way of expressing my emotions. It wasn't until my grandfather died that the subject was put to task. My mother received the news of her dearly beloved father's death. He was my guardian angel. Even at seven years of age, the loss of my Zadie, grandpa in Yiddish, left a gaping hole in my heart. Two days after he died, he or his spirit visited me, really, in the dark. I sat up in bed when I saw my Zadie walk out of my closet. He was wearing his familiar brown suit, white shirt, and tie. I even saw the white socks he always wore with his brown leather tie shoes. He sat down on the side of my bed, put his arm around me, he told me quietly that he would always be with me, and then he vanished. A peacefulness flowed through me. I believed him. Until now, whatever negativity I felt from my mother and notions of not fitting in were buffered by the physical presence and involvement of my grandparents. I kept this incident to myself. Every night, I would kneel at my bedside and say my prayers, thanking my grandpa and grandma for loving me. I always included my mother, father, and brothers in my well wishes. By now, my second brother, Ricky, was born. One weekend morning over breakfast, my brother Alan, now four, accidentally threw a fork across the dining room table. William Tell had nothing on my little brother's marksmanship. His face showed as much shock as mine <laughs> when that fork pierced my skin and stuck in my chest. I reached down to pull the prongs out that left marks and a little trace of blood. It was more of a bruise, really. This incident sent my dad into a roaring rage. Alan st started running away from Maury, who chased after him unsuccessfully. Alan managed to get himself into the one bathroom in our house and locked the door before Maury could take a swing at him. I heard her dad say to my brother, who was behind the closed door, Don't you ever touch your sister again. What happened subsequently shocked me even more. Alan stayed hidden while Maury came back into the dining room table where I was still seated. Across from me was my mother who had handed me a wet napkin to hold on my wound. Maury inquired of me how I was feeling. It was a strange way of showing concern and I began getting the feeling that something else was in their minds. My stomach clenched. Now both Maury and Ruth huddled together and my dad spoke. Donna, he said, we've been thinking about your future. My brain went numb. He continued, we want to know if you really want to study singing because even though it's a hardship on us, we're prepared to pay for singing lessons. Without missing a beat, he continued, if you don't, you'll probably end up working in a five and dime. And the speech was over. Oh, the feeling of insecurity was overwhelming. I felt my head nodding yes and hearing my own thoughts telling me, if I don't say yes, I won't have a home and they won't love me. Maury spoke again. We know you can make more money singing than I can ever make drawing, or your mother can make bookkeeping. Wow, it got clear to me that I had my first business meeting with my parents at age seven. This verbal contract began with the symbol of being pierced in the heart innocently by my little brother throwing a fork at me and was cemented by the words that became the unretractable contractual agreement for the next 14 years of my life. When you reflect back on that time through you, your reading of the memoir of that, that toddler, that toddler on the swing listening to Hank Williams, what do you think about that now, Donna? Oh, thank you, Adam. It's really good to connect. Um, yeah, you know, 
a small child who, um, you know, in her heart, it has a feeling of, you know, as we talked about before, not really belonging, mm. but it's very kind of vague and foggy in, in a small child's mind. But th the idea of being dropped off at, you know, a, a neighbor <laughs> when my, when my, it was for my mother's convenience because she just had a baby mm. and, you know, um, her feelings toward me was, you know, uh, peppered, let's say. Yeah. And, um, and so she literally wanted to have time, you know, with, with her new child, mm. my brother, Alan. And, um, and so she would walk me up the street and kind of deposit me for, uh, for hours. And, um, you know, it, being a very small child, I really wasn't looked after, you know, especially, as I said, you know, the, the woman there never even showed her face. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't um, it? Just thinking if you never saw this woman's face at all. But she did deliver a message, very powerful one, you know, that really touched my heart, mm, you know, mm. um, and, and the voice that delivered the message. Um, it was this mysterious thing, you know, coming out of a dark screen door where I could see nothing behind it. And that's going on for probably till I was five years old. And, um, and then uncle Don, I mean, he was busy, mm. you know, taking care of the rabbits and the mm. chickens and the ducks and everything. And so I got to roam around the property, which was fenced in, you know, so I, I was more or less safe mm. as mm. long as I got along with with all the animals and everything. <laughs> and I parked myself on a swing. I mean, don't you just love a swing, Adam? I live so close now to a playground and I walk my dog in the mornings. And part of me on occasion, I have to admit, we've done it when no one else is there. I will just pick her up and she's absolutely like, what is going on here? And we will sit on the swing and just swing back and forth for a while. I'm there enjoying it much more than she is, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean... There's something so soothing when when you hop on a swing and you just go, you know, you just you just kind of float in the air and the movement really um, puts you just in a different frame of mind. That's an interesting. Yeah. Just just that you say that when I hadn't actually thought about that, that almost as a young child, I mean, I know, you know, children, you know, love to swing. But it's almost as if you were sort of self, you know, soothing yourself at, at that early age. And then, and then along comes this song, which is really interesting that at, as, a, as a, you know, two and a half year old, that you'd relate to the words of, or, or in some way you'd resonate with the words of, you know, your cheating heart. There are clues all along your life to tell you, you know, um, what you may be confused by or, you know, what's cloudy in your mind or, you know, it, it, it may take, who knows, a lifetime. Like myself, it's taken decades to, you know, really clarify these, these messages along the way and understand the truth. But I mm. also want to say that being on a swing gives you a sense of timelessness. You know, I have no idea how long I would sit on that swing mm. and just, mm. you know, kind of um, move with the rhythm and the pace of what was going on in, you know, in my little world, uh, surrounded by <laughs> by this uh, kind of odd but but comforting yeah. situation. And I didn't think about, you know, abandonment. I didn't think about being left behind. I didn't think about... Actually, I, I have recently recalled that the the wife never came mm. out to give me a cookie or never even offered me a, a water. And D Uncle Don was always preoccupied. So however long I was there, mm. you know, it was just me, the swing, the ducks, the chickens, and, <laughs> you know, and the bunnies. Um, and, and my mother didn't supply anything. So, mm. you know, it just gives you uh, an idea of, you know, I could transport myself into a place of um of beauty again mm. um and and maybe connect with uh, some sort of higher energy in, in a very innocent way you know yeah. just as a very small child do you think it established 
a relationship with your mother, like it kind of set the parameters. And I don't know, you know, particularly that became apparent when you had your your first asthma attack shortly after this time. But do you think being left on, on this farm with this, you know, kindly but but still stranger, um, do you think it set this this kind of establishment of what your relationship with your mother was going to be? Oh, well, it was definitely cold, mm. you know. <laughs> I mean, th- my the relationship between my mother and myself, um, you know, I hadn't thought about that. Thank you for asking. I hadn't thought about the continuity, uh, but essentially when, you know, on that chilly night that I had my first asthma attack mm. and my mother... Um, just revealed her true feelings to me um, by showing her, you know, very unempathetic uh, heart and, mm. and, um, and basically, you know, just with our eyes, which are, you know, eyes of the soul. Uh, I could read her and she, her message was loud and clear, you mm. know, that, um, you know, that, okay, uh, this is going to be a relationship about struggle. It's going to be a relationship about suffering. It's going to mm. be a relationship, you know, that um, is, is, uh, is going to be challenging. You know, we all come in. We all come in to meet these challenges. And so, so you know, I guess it's pretty fortunate that, um, you know, that I had the awareness or maybe mm. just, just love to, uh, you know, hum and sing and, you know, and sing along and kind of have an awareness that it gave me courage and it gave me a sense of empowerment, even at such a young age, you yeah. know, so that by the time I was five, you know, and my brother got a little bit older and my mother had to actually, you know, treat us like more like a family and, you know, include me with her relationship with her second Mm. child. Um, There definitely um, a tone that was, I'm going to rhyme this, a tone Mm. set in stone Mm. between, Mm. between she and I, um, because, you know, as, as this time rolls around, you know, she, she takes the opportunity to use you know, what my passion is and turn it into a form of manipulation of course. for her. Yeah, which, which is and, when we come to the, the, the contest, which Uncle Don, I think, you know, noticed that there was going to be a contest held. Um, and so he suggested, because he'd noticed that you, you, um, you know, you liked, you liked singing. Um, and so that's kind of how that came about, wasn't it? It it was, and he also knew that I kind of adored his, his the rumble seat of his Model T that he <laughs> would always keep polished up and yeah. not really drive much. So it gave him an opportunity to drive his car, and it gave me a, an opportunity as a five year old to have a fantasy of sitting mm. in the rumble seat, and uh, and so I guess you know you can say that my mother could have could have treated it like a, a gift, you mm-hmm. know, and say, mm-hmm. you know, gee, I, I see how much you love this and I know how much you love to sing. And so let's combine the two and, you know, and, and, and participate in this event, you know, it, 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 it turned into, um, again, a feeling inside me that, um, you know, I had to obey her every wish mm. And, um, you know, even the fact that the songs that she would select for me, you know, uh, didn't feel like, gee, you know, listen to this song. Isn't it fun? You know, mm-hmm. wouldn't you like to learn it? Or, or I heard you singing along with it. You know, no, it was something that she had to control. And so, um, you know, this was, this was the first real manipulation that I felt, you know, in conjunction with her, the tone that she set, you know, when I had my first asthma attack. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's kind of interesting that um, even with the singing at that time that she chose, um, how much is that doggy in the window, the, the Patty Page 
song, but you kind of even noticed a little bit there that as she was teaching you that song, there was her frustration coming out because she perhaps thought of herself as a singer or, or at least someone who sang around the house and, and had a had a pleasant voice. But it was almost as if she, you, from your perception that she felt in some way that that was being taken away from her as well. Doctor, please <laughs> <laughs> help me out here because, you know, I know that jealousy exists between mothers and daughters. Mm. Mm. You know, I know these conflicts exist and, you know, and sometimes they are irreparable and, and, you know, I don't know if it was only, um, only about jealousy or if it was literally, um, you know, just feeling, uh, I'm just thinking Mm. on my feet Mm. about this because you're raising the issue that you know guilt comes along with jealousy and um and obligation because i think around the age of five is Mm. when i couldn't put it to words but i knew by the time i was in my teens that i was Mm -hmm. obligated Mm. and and so you know i that that began this obedience and this control of her so that uh, you know i knew that if i didn't if I didn't comply with her again, mm. you know, all along the way that um, there would be <laughs> a reckoning for me, yeah. you know, for sure. Yeah. And perhaps, and I know you've spoken about this before, you know, with this perception that well, if I don't do what I'm supposed to and be obedient, then I'm not going to have my parents love. And, 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 you know, that sort of, you know, thinking at that time. And like you said, you probably didn't verbalize it that way or, or sorry, think about it that way. Um, in those words but that's kind of what was coming across because when I think of you know you you go and perform at this local contest you know hosted by Chef Milani who I I know I'm sure there's people who grew up around Culver City and thereabouts who would probably still remember you know um, you know him from that time but you know that seems although there was that proposition that seems like you know a kind of innocuous you know going out and performing there but then what comes next is this very different situation it's not just singing at a local contest you know, somewhere in Culver City. It's where you're performing at a military hospital. And, you know, I know when child child actors, child performers, child stars, whatever we want to call them, you know, speak about their experiences, often some dominant themes come up. And one of the ones that I've kind of come across in speaking to, um, you know, child performers and so on is sometimes that idea of seeing things that they shouldn't have seen at that young age or being exposed to things that they shouldn't have been exposed to at that young age and you know being at a veterans hospital seems like a pretty scary thing for a young child to have to deal with it it really was i mean what i have to say in detail Mm. is that um i was standing in the dark behind the curtain and as i described in the book in in uh, in this chapter that you know I walked out to a totally, you know, lit room, mm-hmm. like I would, if you can imagine fluorescent lighting at the top. And so, you know, it was completely lit. Mm. Um, but standing in the dark behind the curtain before it was my time, I, I did get a peek, mm-hmm. you know, outside. And, and that's when, that's when I lost it. And, you know, I, when I saw those men in wheelchairs with, with those bottles and tubes, you know, um, in basically hospital Mm, gowns mm. and, um, in there were quite a few, it was quite a large audience, you know, hundreds at least of, of veterans that were wounded in, in, the. I guess it was the Korean war at that time. It must've been. Yeah. And, um, and here, here I am, you know, like five years old peeking out and that's when I felt the pee trickling down mm. my leg and mm. by by the time it you know soiled my my socks because mm. you know back in those days little girls wore little white socks with their Oxford yeah. Mary Janes or yeah. something like that <laughs> and um, you know and that's when my mother saw and it gave her the clue to you know um, kind of intercept and and you know give me a reason to get out there yeah. and do what she wanted me to do which was the five dollar note yes yeah. and and as i said you know um that 
really left a dark impression on me mm. so much. Mm. And what I also would like to say is that for our listeners that physically, mm. physically I've had, I've had an issue with my spine mm. and, um, and it's pretty much in the middle of your back, very close. If you go on the latitude of your spine and you go to your left, it's kind of around the heart mm. region. Mm. And, you know, I, I have discovered through doing healing work and the child, you know, um, out of, out of, this obedience um, does does what she does or he does, and um, and something inside brings out the joy for herself. Mm. But um, you know, it's only a moment. It's a moment. It's you know, two three minutes. Mm. Mm. And and what she's left, what she or he or what I personally was left with was the observation of the sorrow yeah. that I felt. And it has accumulated in the heart region in my spine. And, you know, and I've had to um, deal with it, you know, my entire life. So I'm going to use a phrase that, um, you know, many adult mm. child actors have mm. shared, and they kind of call themselves damaged goods. Right. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I know you've probably spoken a little bit. Of course, your your friend from the 1960s, Paul Peterson, you know, headed up for many years and founded, you know, a minor consideration, which is the advocacy group for former, you know, child stars. And I, I'm sure you've, you've probably perhaps spoken a little bit to him about, you know, some of those ideas of child stars at the end of it feeling like like that. Uh, yeah, that's a big, big subject. Uh, Paul's... Um basic uh kind of premise for a minor mm. consideration and mm. there were eight thousand of us that were yeah. signed on to his organization mm. um were uh, yeah i would say maladjusted into adulthood probably very few ron howard jody foster are two examples of child performers who transitioned in their adult lives rather seamlessly and have lived a productive life yeah you know mm. um with the experience of being uh, exposed to so many adults and having that adult responsibility just kind of, you know, put on their shoulders mm. because seriously, whatever age you are, as long as you're a minor, the moment, even if your mother or father are three feet away or, you know, sitting on the set, as soon as, it's your turn to perform. You are taking direction from an adult. You're, mm. you, you know, whether you're working with other children or, or adults, I was always working with adults. Yeah. But yeah. Um, the fact is that, you know, you literally uh, have your childhood robbed from mm. you um, because the sense of responsibility, you know, it's like the, the good old saying, time is money. And that's what happens. And it was, you know. And and when you talk about that idea of, you know, starting to, you know, if, even with the soldiers situation, when you're in the military hospital and you speak about performing for the soldiers and how you felt you could make yourself happy by singing, but how you can make them happy. It seems like at that really early age, you were starting to take on that responsibility for making people happy, whether it was those you were performing for, whether it was the the director, the producer, you know, the time is money, that sort of thing, or whether it was your parents, you were taking on this responsibility for other people's emotions and and other people's happiness and i've that's fair and i've uh that's but i would have to go back to the reference of my friend paul and his organization mm -hmm. um that um the way i conducted my life um somehow i appeared to be one of the ones that uh was the least damaged mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because many of them, first of all, didn't survive, yeah, you know, because yeah. of drugs and alcohol. Mm. Um, uh, I don't know many incidences, uh, you know, I really tried to live my own mm. life, but, mm. but um, mostly uh, the advantage that parents took uh, of their, ch of their working children that, you know, Paul's number one case was uh, trying to um, 
defend the uh, now the adult that should have been compensated, let's say, by a trust fund, yeah. and um, and the parents uh, siphoned off the money. Mm, mm. And so Paul would be an advocate for that. And then his second uh, major case that I believe, you know, uh, to be true is that uh, infants, babies that were used on set, you know, could only be exposed for a very, very limited time to those hot lights and Mm. to be held by strange people Mm. and, um, you know, (laughs) That kind of thing. So, he, you know, other than that, I, I know he took a legal point of view, mostly uh, what I talked about in terms of, you know, finance and um, and giving giving a child a sense of self worth. Yeah, yeah. You know that <laughs> what they're doing, you know, is it, it's 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 a cultural, um, what can I say, deficiency. Mm, mm. That, you know, that um, I I still have to unravel in my mind, you know, and I I should say that, you know, what we talked about earlier is that how many parents, how many mothers and fathers are really prepared to take on the role of parenting when they have a child, Mm. you know, (laughs) and uh, and certainly you know, it's a big responsibility and then it gets passed on from generation to generation. For sure. So, and, and as you've said before, <laughs> it's not, it's not just that, you know, the parents of a child star, it could be that, you know, parents in general, but there could be parents who have illness and, and children take on responsibility and, you know, earlier than they should, or, or they shouldn't at all really, but they, you know, they're, they're having to do that because that I think responsibility, I think comes up a lot in what you talk about, particularly the idea of at the dinner table that night where you've got that 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 biz, so-called business meeting where your adopted dad Maury gives you that sort of proposition of 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 uh, supporting the family and you know I, I guess there's that idea and again this comes down to you know many children speak about this where they take on that responsibility for the family and how did you feel that responsibility that night at the dinner table where you know after being I guess, metaphorically and, and literally, you know, kind of pierced in the heart with a fork, um, you, you're then given this pro- proposition of supporting your family. Definitely. Mm. <laughs> mm. It was, it was um, a surface wound that cut very deep. Mm. And uh, especially, you know, when you're, I, I was seven years old, and to have your parents sitting across from you like you're on one side and they're together on the other side mm. of the table mm. and you're being confronted, you know, to make a decision like on the spot and it's an either or, mm. you know, you're going to be somebody or you're going to be nothing. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's what was delivered to me. And, you know, I had absolutely um, no choice, but to, you know, be in survival Mm. and, um, and, you know, and, and to choose some sort of safety within my, you know, family to make a choice that, you know, basically the hook was, you know, that fortunately somehow I love to sing Mm. enough so that, you know, the pressure that was put on me was, uh, um, kind of eased off by doing what I love to do yeah yeah even though there was there was what was hanging over it that you still have that ability to to do that whether it was singing at a contest early on whether it was then um performing which I know we're going to speak about you know next time about on the Mickey Mouse Club and and what I wonder is you know you were given this so-called choice but I think we can we can see it it wasn't a choice there there wasn't really a choice of what you were going to do and I've spoken to, you know, some child performers and this idea of whether they felt they had some choice in that career or not. And there seemed to be quite a bit of differentiation. And I spoke to um, Mm. a child actress, Kelly Flanagan, who was a co-star on The Ghost and Mrs. Muir with Hope Lang back in the late um, 60s. And she Mm -hmm. told me about the experience of when she would go for, say, an audition. And she 
she said she had responsibility in the sense that if she agreed to go to the audition or she agreed to take the job, she had to do it. There wasn't a choice of sort of backing out afterwards. But what she said is that after each interview she'd have with a casting director, a producer, whatever, her and her mother would sit in the car and her mother would ask her a series of questions and, and you know, including how did it feel? And this is, and she said to me, and I'm essentially quoting from what she told me in that interview is that she said, we would talk about what would happen if I got the job. If I agreed to do the job, I had to carry it through and again, couldn't change my mind. But interestingly, she says, I do not remember one instance when I had to go to a job I did not want to. To my recollection, I always had a say in things and was encouraged to use my instincts when it came to reading people. That is the people who are interviewing me, usually casting people, um, you know, or ad people or directors. And and so there does seem to be this differentiation and often, you know, many younger people felt they were involved in some choice. But for you, while it was posed to you, I guess, as a choice, it, it doesn't really seem to be one, does it? Uh, after everything you've just said, mm. um, I think some children are recognized, you know, that really love performing. Mm. You know, mm. they're not shy. That you, know, you can't stop them from performing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, I think, uh, for example, I think the the singer Bruno Mars is, you know, I think he was like replicating Elvis when he was three years old. <laughs> And, and his parents recognized it. I don't know all the details, but, you know, they may have just um, supported him along the way so that he could do what he loved to do. And if so, I would say in a circumstance like that, where uh, many child performers live for the idea mm. of providing their parents with a home and, you know, and helping their parents. It's like, mm. oh, I can help you. Yeah. Um, because you helped me. There's a reciprocal relationship on some level. Mm. Even though at a very still at a very young age, you know, there are situations that compromise your childhood. Um, but <laughs> I would say that maybe that's uh I, I don't I just don't come from that school. I come from the school of being controlled. And mm -hmm. I also come from, you know, a, a situation where it's not easy to explain because my parents were very good at, uh, at representing themselves as a close family mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. wanting the best for me. And that was the message that they, you know, represented uh, to other people. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what happened in my you know, private life and what motivated me to, you know, to do what I did and so-called make, make the decisions that I made. Yeah. And I think it, it kind of leads us on to, you know, this next experience in, in, in your life uh, or in your you know career, as we could call it that at, at that early age of, of, you know, going to, um, you know, going to do something that was a, a pretty big deal. And that was doing the Mickey Mouse Club at, you know, just as you were turning, turning 10. So I'm wondering if, you know, now's the time to sort of, you know, leave our listeners here and, and to invite them to tune in for our next episode, um, when you talk about getting a role on the Mickey Mouse Club. Love's a secret weapon, and that's that's our that's our message. You know, that's who we are. You know, we're putting out that that secret, which is spelled L O V E, in telling this story. So, you know, yes, let's continue. Okay. See you next time, everyone. Yes, love.